Hello, and welcome to the 2020 Tucson Humanities Festival. My name is Alain Philippe Durand, and I'm the Dean of the College of Humanities. Thank you for joining us. My esteemed colleagues have prepared these presentations to challenge and inform us, and perhaps help us seek better solutions to the problems we face in the world today. Now, please enjoy this presentation and visit our website, humanitiesfestival.arizona.edu, for the complete event schedule, as well as recordings of this event and future events. The 2020 Tucson Humanities Festival is supported by the Humanities Seminars Program. The program offers premier adult education by top university professors from its home here in the College of Humanities. Hello, my name is Brett Asaki. Today I'm going to talk about the ever-elusive concept of silence, which is the main topic of my book. Uh, as I define it there, silence is the place of connection and coexistence. Japanese Americans have used silence to survive abject conditions of racism uh, and a way to maintain their spirit. Today I'm going to talk about it in relationship to justice. Now, what do we know about activism and injustice? These are very loud things. They're declarative things. They're going out and making your voice heard. Uh, well, what ends up happening is that although it does great things, like the Civil Rights Act of 1988, uh, also uh, it ignores a lot of culture and and uh, and survival. Today I'm going to cover three main points. Uh, Japanese American history, especially its relationship to silence and justice, um, the modes of silence I've used uncovered through ethnographic research, and uh, to point to how there's in fact little silence and justice, and to point towards new forms of justice that would include silence. Uh, so Japanese Americans have faced racism throughout their history in the United States. Uh, interesting enough, this is often focused on language, what we're saying, how we're writing about it, what we're not saying. Uh, and the most uh, often reaction to this, racist reaction to this, is to silence us. Um, and so silence has a very complex, uh, uh, we have a complex relationship to silence. Uh, one common response to this racism by Japanese Americans is just to persevere. You know, keep your head down, be quiet, uh, have good morals, work hard, and eventually someone will respect you. Um, that does work in small orders, but it is, is ultimately not you know, very effective. Uh, another response we've had, uh, and a very you know, uh, good one, is to reclaim our voice, to enter activist circles, um, find what we've lost, uh, make sure those who have um, been uh, violated and suffered injustice to let them be known. Um, this has been important. George Takei did this um, uh, in talking about his experience in the World War II inter internment camps. Um, but what, what does my research do? It looks at silence uh, that that is not covered by the, those two responses. Uh, in particular, strategic silence. Um, those are ends up being, as I argue, sustainable, healing, though non-triumphant. So uh, you know, it doesn't get the um, the headlines, but ends up being very important. What did I have to do to illustrate this? Well, I had to create, uh, well, utilize a lot of forms of notation to try to illustrate the different forms of silence that Japanese Americans use. Um, and today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, three of them uh, taken outside of the, uh, that context. The first one is dance notation, uh, which talks about the space of peoples. Uh, what I do use with that is to illustrate the forms of intimacy that Japanese Americans develop amongst themselves as well as with other forms of life. And what I've uh, discovered is it, it uh, is a way of um, relating and guiding people through the life and death process. Another mode I look at is uh, notated through sign language notation, um, and the expression around uh, of space around the body. Uh, what I d discover with that is that uh, Japanese Americans use the space around them to illustrate the emotional power of the human spirit. Uh, that is, um, as an individual, uh, as a group, uh, with each other, as well as to recognize different forms uh, of spirits that they believe exist. 
Another uh, mode that I illustrate is through music notation. Uh, music notation, if you're not familiar, illustrates multiple lines of things occurring at once. In other words, simultaneity. Uh, and I use that notation to illustrate um, that Japanese Americans have developed a lot of rhythms of survival under racism, um, and and uh, this creates uh, allows their spirit to uh, to survive. Now let's think about justice. Uh, there's actually little silence in the just forms of justice that we have, or even conceptions of justice. Um, so today, uh, thinking about silence in these different uh, modes that Japanese Americans have had, um, there are others that um, we can learn to respect. Uh, now, someone might argue, in our system of justice, we have the freedom not to speak. However, that implies in our justice system, guilt. And so I, I would argue we really need a lot more interpretive modes uh, to understand what silence might mean. It's not just guilt, uh, it's not just subterfuge or annoyance, uh, avoidance, but uh, uh, much, uh, much broader possibilities. Another thing to consider is that we generally consider vulnerability to be a weakness, uh, and silence is often associated with vulnerability. Instead of that, I would like us to consider the much more wide emotional range of humans uh, and uh, to have that included in our, in our conceptions of each other as well as injustice. Um, a, a last for a, a form I'd also like you to consider um, is that we generally consider avoidance to be a lack of, of strength or impotence uh, or subterfuge, in, in, in fact. Instead of that, I would also like to think of avoidance as often as strategic or an expression of intelligence or recognition of really abject difficult situations that uh, um, that we are un that people undergo. Uh, I'd like you to take a step back here and think about our preference for loudness and language. Um, this is this occurs in our cultural in general and, and includes our activism and sense of justice. However, these aren't the only forms of justice. And if we keep preferencing loudness and language, we're going to end up marginalizing many people, many cultures. And I'd argue it's not the most sustainable form of justice. So what to do? A few quick steps. Respect. Uh, respect each other's culture, uh, learn about cultural knowledge, uh, learn about other, uh, develop cultural knowledge, and especially study more silence. Uh, and you'll find many things like I did, uh, a wide variety of, um, of results. Uh, what, what to do also? Question, especially the norms of speaking and what speaking does uh, and, and, and supposed to indicate about your value. Instead, I'd say, think about the larger expanse of what speaking and not speaking and listening and attention might be and what the strategic uses of them, its importance to them, and also the value of those practices. And lastly, as we learn more about these things and question more, we're going to learn to, in we should learn to integrate these modes of silences, uh, of silence into our practice, into our values, and ultimately into our sense of justice. Um, before, as I leave, I'd like you to think of an essential point of what is the long sustainable future that we want to have? Generally speaking, we tend to think of immediate concerns, injustices, and, and that we need to speak out. And of course, that's very important. But think about the long term. What kind of justice do we want to have? I would ask you to consider silence as an important element in this long sustainable future, uh, especially because that is what has sustained uh, many Japanese Americans through our experience. Thank you so much. I came to be interested in language learning and use through my own experiences working, studying, and researching abroad in multilingual contexts. As a student, I took part in intercultural experiences in primarily Canada, the US, Germany, Spain, Austria, Czech Republic, and Greece. Pictured here, Marburg, Germany, where I spent one year. As a white, straight, and cisgender German language learner, my experiences match how academic departments, colleges, and university global offices often characterize study abroad affirming, exhilarating, and life-changing. Yet I also knew that this was not always so for others. I hadn't yet realized that study abroad success was never just about individual responsibility. Years later, as an assistant professor of German studies with many years of expertise in language and intercultural learning, questions surrounding student mobility, such as multilingualism and language use while abroad, and more recently access to study abroad, have continued to be of practical, pedagogical, and scholarly interest. As an example of this, like many others in the humanities and related disciplines, I have worked to promote, co-design, and lead summer or short-term study abroad programs because I'm still eager to, one, have my students experience life and language use in different global contexts, much like we see in the picture here. 
too, I am also very interested in helping our students accrue the number of credits that would make it possible for them to continue enrolling in, or even better, minoring or majoring in German studies and or other fields in the various humanities disciplines at the University of Arizona. Three, I continue to be eager to conduct new research projects in and around student mobility questions where language learning is concerned. And lastly, importantly, until recently, intercession and summer study abroad programs were ways to create much needed summer income for contingent and or nine month faculty. Yet these reasons have also resulted in critical questions that make the implicit beliefs about study abroad and student mobility that I carry with me even more explicit. What desires and beliefs have shaped my experiences with program design and recruitment? Whose knowledge have I relied on or excluded when designing and leading study abroad? Whom do I assume our students to be? How do my own and my students' identities and experiences challenge my work with study abroad programs and projects? For example, the effects of my own privilege around international mobility and language learning become salient in contexts where students have experienced racial discrimination abroad. The question becomes, how do I remediate my own shortcomings in study abroad program design, leadership, and research? Scholars in numerous language-related fields like critical applied linguistics and language teacher education have rightly pointed out that our scholarship relies on racist and sexist epistemologies or racist and sexist ways of knowing. The fact of the matter is, most research on study abroad has focused on the experiences of the primarily white language learners who study abroad. And while recent reckonings, including calls for racial justice and the critical dismantling of white supremacy, have begun to emerge in many humanities fields, including my own, German studies as seen here, as those who design, lead, market, and even fondly recall our experiences with study abroad, we must reconsider and revisit what we perpetuate when we talk about study abroad. In working to bring my own practices into closer conversations with calls for racial justice, I recently identified some common ways that folks talk about study abroad. My aim here is not to argue against study abroad per se, but rather encourage a reconsideration of how we talk, ways that often seem common and harmless, yet that also move us away from justice-based work because they exclude. These include, one, study abroad is access to native likeness, or there's a right way to speak German and you must go there to get close to it. Who decides this? What about those who can never approach a native likeness because they are always heard as deficient speakers regardless of how objectively native-like their linguistic practices are? Two, study abroad is access to collecting multiple monolingualisms or discrete linguistic systems like German that you can go out and collect instead of multilingual abilities already expanding. Three, study abroad as access to other cultures or cultures made countable, German versus American. What about students who already live interculturally and multilingually in their everyday life? Four, study abroad is enhancing resume and career, or it is valuable because of the link to its value in the global economy. But what about multilingualists who did not study abroad? Are their resumes not enhanced? Perhaps we can focus on study abroad as a support to students as they expand what they already have in terms of listening, dialoguing, and navigating different contexts. These ways of talking about language and culture can cause harm. Recent events have exposed our societal and educational structures as rooted almost entirely in white supremacy. Uh, for example, see the unequal health and economic toll of the COVID-19 pandemic on racialized bodies. Language fields must take ownership and promptly remedy how white supremacy has persisted unchecked in their fields. And while other ways of knowing about study abroad exist, we often do not know about them or value them. How can study abroad lean on more than one way of knowing and thereby not exclude any voices? It's time to look more closely at how our often disconscious actions affect our students and programs. Especially in times like these, we can move toward undoing harm. I offer the following first steps for possible ways forward towards undoing harm. Be curious. Read more widely. We can prioritize voices that are often marginalized by mainline academia and language studies. This includes diffusing and decentering our own expertise to read and think with different ways of knowing about student mobility and language learning. Two, intentionally dialogue with these other ways of thinking. We can cite and center these other ways of knowing about international mobility and language learning and use this work to help shape our programs. We can create and market programs with knowledge that is steeped in the idea that language learning and mobility are community phenomena. Three, Situate program participants in the systems and power structures around them. Where study abroad takes place, we can prepare marginalized students for experiences around race, gender, sexuality, and other dimensions in which they encounter local understandings and articulations. We can prepare all students to advocate for themselves and others, and our programs and pedagogies can ask students to think about these things. 
Four, choose different constructions around recruitment. We can build quality communities and move beyond counting individual bodies. We can dissolve steeper hierarchies in favor of relationships, well-being, trust, and equitable access. This is not easy in the spaces we live and work, but to do less harm, we should move toward positioning language learning and mobility as community linked Many individuals are frequently excluded from important aspects of life because of limited English skills. According to the U.S. Census, a limited English proficient LEP person is anyone age five and older who reported speaking English less than very well. Overall, the LEP population is 8% of the total U.S. population. Exclusion due to limited English skills can take place in the courts, the hospitals, the schools, restricting an individual's access to justice, to health care, to education, etc. The consequences of this are often serious, as these are frequently high-stakes situations. In addition, LEP individuals can be excluded from research studies because of the obstacles that language can pose for researchers. These obstacles, which can be financial, they cannot pay for services, and practical, they do not have the time or they do not know how to address the situation, can affect the provision of materials and consent procedures. There are federal regulations against discrimination on the basis of national origin and language by all agencies receiving federal funds. Examples of this are Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Executive Order 13166 of the year 2000, and yet we find that the problem remains. One solution to the language access problem is translation and interpreting. Translation refers to the written transfer or the rewriting of one document from one language to another, and interpreting is oral. In some cases, mixed modalities, oral and written, may also be possible. However, providing a text or communicative event in the non-majority language does not guarantee inclusion or equitable participation on a part with English-speaking individuals. There are research studies that show that in many cases, translated texts exhibit poor readability or lower readability than non-translated texts. We need to provide quality translation and interpreting. But what do we mean by quality? Correct language? High register? Usable language? People have different opinions. How do we measure it? How does a researcher know that the non-English materials are working as intended and that research participants understand them? Some mechanisms commonly used to provide and assess translation can be problematic. Back translation, which consists of translating the translation back into the original language and assessing the match, presumes one-to-one -one correspondence among languages. There are also issues with bilinguals who tend to translate word for word. Using qualified professionals is perhaps the best option out there to guarantee quality, but this could pose comprehension issues for some populations because professionals value professional norms and these tend to prioritize formal and prestigious varieties of the language. Given the challenges I just described, one goal of my current work is to contribute to more equitable participation of LEP research study participants. And by equitable, I mean true participation, not just providing some materials that appear to be in the participant's language. How do I contribute to equitable participation in research for LEPs? I try to create awareness and to provide empirical evidence that shows that translation poses a methodological issue in research participation and that simply providing a translation does not guarantee equal access. So let me tell you about a study that I recently completed in collaboration with graduate students and colleagues at the University of Arizona and which was funded by COH. The study investigates how translation approach affects the usability of a survey and how users respond to it. Do they understand it? Can they answer the questions? So we compared an existing published survey, the Personal Stress Survey, which had a word-for-word -word approach probably carried out by bilinguals without training. In a new one developed with a functionalist approach, which we designed thinking of the questions and the answers from the perspective of the participant. So, the results of the study show that Spanish speakers preferred the functionalist translation. They found that it was easier to understand, they raised fewer questions, and also have fewer comments in semi-structured interviews. This suggests that a word-for-word -word approach may impede participant comprehension in research surveys. 
While a word-for-word -word approach impedes comprehension, a professional translation can also miss the mark when it comes to communities to which the professional does not belong in terms of age, race, socioeconomic background. These professionals know language structurally, but they may not know how to write questions that participants will engage with. Furthermore, professional norms favor the use of prestigious forms of language, and many translators want to distinguish themselves from less professional ones. Other translators do not have the training to adjust their translations to the needs of the populations they translate for. So what is the solution? I would like to propose the formulation of a collaborative translation model in alignment with a community-based participatory research approach. CVPR. Of course, obtaining funding for it and for its implementation are also crucial elements of this proposal. Community-based participatory research, CBPR, refers to an approach to conducting research that equitably involves community members, researchers, and other stakeholders in the research process. All partners contribute expertise in sharing decision-making. It partners researchers and those directly affected by the research conducted. Community-based participatory translation, CBPT, constitutes the cultural and linguistic dimension of CBPR. It resorts to qualified, trained interpreters and translators that belong to the community and are stakeholders and partners in the research project, along with researchers, community members, and a translation studies expert. I would like to conclude by drawing your attention to the fact that at the UA we are in a privileged position to develop a CBPT model and to contribute to equity in research due to our resources, translators and specialists in translation studies at the National Center for Interpretation, well-established network of community partnerships and countless researchers.